Fantastic. So welcome everyone uh, to the panel. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, re breaking the Bauhaus, reboot, rebooting art and design education. And I'll pass you over to Richard Adams. Good morning all. Um, yeah, this, this was a, an interesting sort of panel um, when Left Terrace and I talked about it and decided to sort of run this panel. Um, it was based on a conversation I'd had about how I felt that a hundred years on from the Bauhaus, which has largely been a major influence in uh, European, in particular, design and art education. Um, I felt there was a new age of industry sort of emerging that, that was based on neuroscience and artificial intelligence and all of these things. And I, I wondered, and I was questioning with, with Left Harris and with other people, how schools and how colleges are actually addressing that. One of the things is I've, over the years, I have written art and design curriculum within <clears throat> technological contexts at every level of the, the system from secondary school, um, even up to sort of second supervising doctorates and things. And, and I've written master's degrees for composing for classical musicians, for composing game music and um, master's degree in, in computer arts and things like this. And I've always been concerned with the drift, I think, towards sometimes the easy way out of just teaching people software but not actually addressing the, fundament the fundamentals underlying it. So, you know, I, simple questions I was asking myself to frame this discussion were, you know, students learn to work with paint. They learn how to work with color. Where do they learn to work with light, for instance? Good morning, Kadeen. We'll do Hello. the in a moment. Hi. Um, so where do they learn to work with light? You know, at college, I learned how to make paint. I learned how to set lettering manually, all of those things. I understand the medium as was, but how do we propose to educate students to understand the medium of artificial intelligence or bio art to get the most of them out of them? You know, for me, design in particular is, a, is an output of a process initiated and controlled by people at each step. If you work with a for want of a better word, a robot that does most of that for you, what are the new steps in that process? Um, and, and, you know, what are the new crafts that are coming out? Because actually, we've also seen the rise of a lot of push button art, push button design. We have pieces of software, you know, Photoshop recently launched Change Your Sky as a feature. Now, I don't know if that's a photograph once you've changed the sky, the foreground, and uh, the landscape in front, is that actually still a photograph or not? Is it something new? And what are the skills people need to be able to sort of rationalise that? But then also, back in, into the sort of system, how do people need to teach and what do they need to teach in order to do that? And my interest lies in that, in that I've got a, a career that has flip-flops, jumped between education and emerging technology in, in the work, you know, in industry, in, co in commerce. And I've never seen a problem with just jumping between those two things. And I found the art skills I've got incredibly useful when I'm architecting a system uh, because concept, the concepts and the, and the conceptual approach has been incredibly useful. So all of these questions have been racing through my mind and um, I'm starting to put it down on paper. You know, I'm writing a book. Uh, chapter first and then a book following that on this. And so we were very, very interested in exploring this because actually within 20 to 30 years, all of our current students will be at the top of their industries and they will be in a vastly different workplace, I suspect, to the workplace we are still in now. Uh, there will be much more automation, much more intelligence, etc. Now, is the appropriate place, and I'll give you one last question, is the appropriate place to teach colour theory, for instance, in a classroom with art teachers, or is it in physics, given that so much output is on screen? I don't know, is the answer. And, and, and I, think, I don't think many of our education systems are equally are addressing this. Um, we are doing very well, and there are some fantastic designers coming out now using these things, but I don't know if we are doing that partly by accident <laughs> or whether actually there's no need to change because conceptually everything can happily stay the same. So uh, in putting this panel together, I, I've sort of pulled together just four basic questions for the panel 
Uh, one is what do we need to teach students if they're to work with emerging tech? Um, if designers and artists of the near future use tech and science as part of their craft, then what would, do we need to teach in terms of aesthetics and philosophy? <clears throat> you know, the Bauhaus had a clear philosophy and curriculum that was born in and reflected the age of mass production. What's the new version of that what we need now for the age of what I like to call unnatural intelligence? Um, how do courses and schools need to change to deliver art and design for this emerging landscape? And where do you know traditional arts and crafts sit alongside this? Because actually they're not going away. And in a lot of ways, traditional arts and crafts are being empowered by technology. Because actually suddenly it's easier to make things than it ever was. So those are the four questions we've posed to the panel. What I propose to do is to let the panel introduce themselves each now, uh, one after the other. I think if, if you want, we could start with Phil Cleaver if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Phil Cleaver. And what uh, do you do? <laughs> uh, well, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm a I work two days a week as a professor at Middlesex University, and I work four days a week running a small design company called Et Al. And I've been designing since 1977. Thank you. And over to China now, <laughs> Ying Wang. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm Ying Wang. So in China, people call me Wang Ming. Ah, um, Wang Ming. Yeah. So family <laughs> name first, and then uh, Ming. The Given last. name second, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm both a designer and educator. I have spent my career working as a designer and as educator for quite many years. Um, to make the introduction a little bit longer than Phil, I will give you some background. So after spending 20 years in the West, study in Germany and also in the US at the Yale University. I returned to China 17 years ago. Uh, I took a position as the dean of a newly established school, School of Design at the China Central Academy of Fine Arts, short name as Kafa. So I was managing the school for 13 years and uh, watched the school expanded quickly. Now it's uh, one of the best in China. So uh, six years after the school was uh, established in 2002, um, in 2009, Business Week uh, had an issue which uh, focused on design education. Uh, they choose Kava as one of the 30 best design programs uh, in the world. So now with my partner, Michelle Dibor, some of you may know, uh, formerly creative director of uh, Studio Dunbar. We both have a studio in Shanghai. Uh, the studio has two places, one at the Tongji University School of Design. Another one is uh, with the De Dao Siva. So I'm engaging into uh, design and education. Yeah, that's my a long introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kadeen James, yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, um, everybody. Um, my name is Kadeen James. I am a creative technologist. Um, I've spent the last 10 years um, working with uh, advanced technologies, including 3D printing, rapid prototyping, artificial intelligence, machine learning virtual reality, extended reality, um, and creating uh, environments using gaming um, engines, particularly Unreal and Unity. I'm also the founder of The Immersive Kind, which is an extended reality agency. And we're working um, at the forefront uh, in terms of 
new applications for digital technologies and particularly how they're being applied in industry from an innovation and enterprise perspective. Uh, and then in addition to that, I've also co-founded a, a 3D Skills Academy in London um, where we're teaching 3D printing, uh, digital visualization, architectural and product model making with a focus of exploring the future of these technologies. Um, so very much involved uh, in the education design piece and thinking a lot about the future of art and design uh, and technology um, and particularly industry 4.0 and what will the skills and attributes <coughs> be um, in order to navigate um, what is a, a very uncertain world um, and I guess supporting students to achieve um, the unachievable. Those are things that I'm really interested in. Thank you. I, I realise I haven't fully introduced myself either. Um, I've been working, I'm, I'm, you know, like, I studied fine art, uh, came out as a painter and immediately went headlong into trying to use computing. Um, and I've spent the last 30 years working with technology and creativity in different ways. I've been a school teacher um, where I introduced, well, I was trying to teach art with Archimedes computers 30 years ago. So um, in an art room in a secondary school. So that was very difficult. Um, uh, and then I went and did a very visionary master's degree at Middlesex University in the early 90s, the C, um, CID course, which was computing and design, it was called. But actually, it took artists and designers who were already graduates and taught us basically the interior of computers <laughs> and the network. So we could use it as a medium. So that refers back to some of the questions. And ever since then, that's kind of stuck with me. Um, I think it was an incredibly visionary course. It, it produced randomly brilliant and randomly average work in equal measures, um, which I think all good courses should, because actually it's people trying to think, fail, think, fail. Since then, I've had jobs as creative directors. I've earned up, spent a lot of time in interactive television, worked um, making interactive game shows, uh, all sorts of things. I've founded a university department, created degrees and master's degrees. Um, what else, God? I've had a visiting professorship. I'm currently a visiting senior fellow at Lincoln University, and um, I've co-founded a college of creativity with Mark Lewis in, in London, the School of Communication Arts, among other things. I've been an external examiner, but I've also worked at in digital emerging technology at, the ex, uh, at Microsoft Xbox, Royal Shakespeare Company, BBC, Sky, um, etc. So, you know, I flip-flopped through this, but never quite left the education side, as evidenced by the fact I'm chair of an educational charity called Professors Without Borders, which sends specialists to do workshops uh, where people could best access that kind of knowledge uh, and can't normally get access. So... That's me, hence my educa interest in education, even though my job title is principal architect, by the way. <laughs> That's, uh, huh. Right, so if we can go on with the first question. I mean, the first question I've got in the list, really, uh, here is just to Richard. start. Yeah, sorry, left Eric, go. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Lefteris Heratakis. Ah, uh, I'm, uh, apologize. Uh, no worries. I no thought worries. you just no used yourself because you've no been worries. only here for two no days. Worries. No worries, no worries. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a designer and a lecturer in... Um, when I started teaching, I saw the disconnect between industry, uh, education, and students. So there was, there was, there was a phenomenal disconnect. Uh, so looking into this disconnect, uh, I met Richard actually uh, in London some years ago and, and, uh, because I bumped into this fantastic uh, school he was creating at the time. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, after that was actually after creating this discussion about uh, this education, students and industry, uh, I started Design Education uh, uh, Talks podcast last year. And actually before that, uh, the, for the first Design Education Forum uh, in uh, Alicante last year, which was a physical forum. So right now we are in a virtual uh, situation. And uh, it's, an incredible, it's an incredible chance to talk about the uh, future of design education. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologise. No That's terribly rude of me. Um, I just thought with you being here for two days, you would have introduced yourself. <laughs> no, no, anyway. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so anyway, in a, in, a, in a sort of way, as I said earlier, I'd set the panelists four questions. And if we can start, I guess, with what do we actually need to teach students, we might as well just go headlong into this, really. Do you, do you want to repeat the first question? I, I'm just about to. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and and that, <laughs> that first question is, you know, what do we need to teach students if they are to work with the emerging tech, AI, biotech, neuroscience, et cetera, in the creative fields? And I'm hesitating using the word design because actually, obviously, the barriers are breaking down. Art is design and design is art now and all of that sort of stuff. So I think we're seeing the, the sort of disappearance of disciplines in a way. But so, you know, um, Kadeen, if you want to start with you, I mean, what do we need to start teaching students that we're not already teaching them? I think it's a brilliant question. And um, I think, you know, from, from my kind of perspective, um, having worked in the industry for some time and co-founded a, a 3D Skills Academy uh, with the Mayor of London, um, we've been thinking a lot about 3D technology um, and how we could make it accessible. Um, and we identified that there was a gap between education in 3D technology and experience within the industry itself. Um, so we were thinking about ways that we could kind of support um, with providing um, skills and experience within the 3D industries in order to progress for a future in architecture, in the built environment, in the creative industries, in VFX. Um, so we established uh, a state-of-the-art training program um, based in East London um, and the curriculum was very much focused on um, future technologies uh, including 3D printing um, and gaming uh, software and environments. Um, so I think you know we need to be starting from a very young age, um, from primary school, nursery school even, thinking about what will be the skills and attributes needed uh, in order to navigate um, a very uncertain world. And I think creativity um, and being able to adapt <laughs> Um, are the key things um, that we need to be teaching our young people. Um, thinking about robotics, thinking about artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, and running um, workshops alongside academic institutions and working with industry and looking at ways that we can kind of facilitate partnerships with primary schools, with nurseries, and with the education system and acting as a bridge between industry, um, academia um, and the curriculum. And I think one of the other things that really springs to mind, Richard, is that we need to be invested in education. I think the education system here in the UK is horribly underfunded um, and we need to be putting better policies and procedures in place in order to address that for society. I think um, Wang Min, if you, if you would like to the floor is yours. Sure. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm very interested in today's uh, discussion. The topic you uh, raised is um, exactly uh, what we have been thinking and have been thinking recently. Uh, last year, we um, had a big uh, conference uh, in China to celebrate 100 years of Bauhaus. Mm. So during that meeting, during that conference, by the way, most uh, attendees were teachers from different universities. So I had the talk, uh, my, the topic of my talk was um, design in the age of artificial intelligence, the beauty of uncertainty. So we are facing a new big challenge, a new challenge. Uh, AI and the technology will really change the design, what we think of, the way how we do design, and the way how we think of design. And um, so being uh, a designer by myself, I've been working with technology for all those years, uh, starting in 1986, I uh, involved with uh, 
design with Adobe, but then Adobe was quite small. So uh, I went through the whole desktop publishing revolution. And uh, at Adobe, I was uh, uh, first being designer and then later being the, the art director and the design manager, managing the design department at Adobe. So that gave me a perspective how we could deal with technology and working with technology. And uh, so um, during that time, I was also teaching at the Yale University uh, graphic design program. And uh, then later after I start uh, working in China, uh, being the dean and uh, building uh, the newly established design school. So that gave me a different kind of way of looking what designer should be, what kind of designer we should educate. And then now facing the new challenge, especially what uh, AI can do for the industry. That also uh, gave, uh, gave me a, a kind of, a, 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 let me to think of what kind of designer we, um, we need to educate. So um, first, um, we do need to have all students to have uh, the computational thinking the computational thinking ability and to deal with the future, which I had of them, to work with uh, technology, to work with AI. But in the same time, we also do need to teach them critical thinking. We do need to teach them art. We do need to teach them the basic foundation of being a good person, a good creative person. So at the CAFA, uh, about six years ago, uh, two years before I stepped down as the dean, we have come up with a, a plan to, call, to focus on general design education to make change, meeting the challenge of uh, the new era, the new AR, the new fourth industrial revolution. To build a design school, more like uh, the liberal art education model in the US, which is uh, for most part of the time in college, in university, Student, students don't select majors. They explore different things. They expanded their view, their vision, and to gaining different knowledge in order to have the critical thinking ability and uh, create creative creative thinking ability, reasoning, and uh, self-learning, all those basic quality a person uh, should have. And then later on, uh, when they work on their graduation project, they will get into a studio or with uh, um, a professional, teacher to get into deeper uh, in certain profession. So in that way, during the, the first few years uh, cross-disciplinary study, they have the, the time to explore different things, to build themselves as a person who is reasoning, who is thinking, critical thinking ability. And that will prepare them to go to the industry later on and uh, moving forward 
into the new time, the new future. So that kind of uh, uh, model um, is uh, something we are working on uh, in Kafa's uh, education setup. But it doesn't mean this is a, a model which could uh, work well with other school. So for instance, um, the school now I'm teaching, uh, also teaching uh, Tongji University School of Design, which is a wonderful school. Uh, this year, QS ranked them, not Tongji School of uh, Design as uh, number 10 in design education. So at the Tongji, um, the student, the first year they were, uh, the education was uh, being uh, managed by the Hall University. Starting second year and uh, the School of Design will set up their classes. But during that time, they do have uh, a certain uh, discipline and uh, surrounding their discipline, they select classes and, uh, but all of them needed to learn uh, coding. So all of them, of them needed to learn this uh, computational thinking ability. So um, back to um, when I was thinking of, first we do need to teach a student to have the uh, computational thinking ability, but in the same time, we do need uh, some uh, training which uh, uh, to um, let them also learn other things. And uh, most importantly, to become a good person, a person who is uh, empathy and uh, a person who is uh, reasoning and a person who is uh, uh, creative thinking and also uh, a person could learn things later on in their long career, in their, in their life. So it's difficult to just talk about what kind of thing they should learn. But the important thing is uh, we need to have a really open-minded and uh, uh, thinking of to, to, to educate a person, not educate a person with a certain skill. So um, I, th I think that's, um, that's actually you know, I think that's, a very, very important yeah. point. And certainly uh, a couple of us talked the other day mm -hmm. before prior to this. And one thing coming out of there is, you know, that ability to sort of be a type of person is a very strong thing. And I think yeah. artists and designers always have been certain types of people in a sense. Um, yeah. but, but the need yeah. for the shape of that is possibly changing. You yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I could uh, add a few more words, mm -hmm. um, um, I think uh, um, it's very important to me, almost not, the, the, the key question is not uh, what kind of curriculum should I set up, it's uh, what kind of uh, uh, mindset and the vision and uh, ideas the faculty members should have. Yeah. I think it's very important for all the faculty members, the dean, the, 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 the directors, and all the faculty members to have a, uh, to have a collective uh, goal, a collective vision. And uh, they all aiming for the same direction to building or to educate a certain kind of uh, student for the future. Once they have that kind of a vision together, regardless what kind of class they are teaching, each class could turn into a class 
that really give in students many qualities that we are looking for for the future designers. But a craft related teaching, a class, could also teach students how to think, teach students how to work together with other people, with the team, and uh, can also teach students and uh, working for the, of the humanity, not just for one person, for uh, himself or herself. So I think this is a very important that uh, uh, to have uh, all the faculty members share the same um, idea. And uh, because uh, if you have the same idea uh, to build uh, the, the designer for the future, then even a traditional class, a color, a color class, could not only teach students learn how to appreciate color, how to work with color, how to have a, a good aesthetic with color study, and but also to have a kind of a international perspective perspective of color and uh, to have a, a kind of a, a, a way of thinking that could work with uh, AI to have a, a solution come up with a color. A solution could combine color with a, a certain AI system to make a, a better uh, result. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's uh, something I've been thinking, uh, which uh, I also talking to uh, my uh, faculty member when I was uh, managing the school. And uh, now I'm uh, also uh, talking to people who I work with. And uh, so if, uh, if we teach, then we should have the same idea. What kind of person we uh, need to educate. I think that's uh, the most difficult piece of this. Where do you find the people who can educate yeah. in the way needed with the mentality? And it's something we faced with the School of Communication Arts. How, do, how could we deal with te fine teachers who could yeah. address pure creativity without worrying about the skills or without, you know, um, so that it could be put in any context? Phil, if you, if you want to sort of come in and address this, that would be great. I, well, one of the interesting things I, when I went to the Central um, in 1970s was they nearly got the degree course taken away because they weren't producing mini graphic designers. They were training people on how to think, how to come up with concepts, how to deal with visual worlds. And, and it was nearly impossible to try to do graphics because you got, it wasn't part of your cur curriculum. So what that's left me with is the fact I always ask, why do you do that? Why can't we do this? It makes inquisitive thinking. It makes you come up with problem solving um, and ideas. And it teaches you to play and relax about if you're a designer or not. And what that does is all the technology is just to be there to be used to, to actually um, be, your, to be your slave. And, and the problem a lot of design schools have is they produce... Either produce mini, mini graphic designers in an art school, or they produce what I call Mac monkeys, which are people that know how to work every program but don't know how to think. And I yeah. think as we go forward, producing students which are rounded and know how to problem solve can then go into any situation with the confidence to actually use any emerging technology. I mean, all, all three of you have mentioned about breaking down boundaries and disciplines in different ways. You're, you're, not, you're saying that, you know, actually the problem can, can be solved, you know, in different ways by students who can think and by designers and artists who can think. So if you think about that, how, how does that impact the delivery of design education and art education? Should the design department exist now? Or should it exist in different pieces across a university in using, say, the liberal arts model that, that we've just heard about? You know, is that more of a model? Because I certainly studied in very narrow courses but that taught me to think outside. But we were, had very much got at home and an identity on the courses we did. 
should in a school a school be addressing creativity for the future by getting physics physics teachers to be creative and by getting historians to talk about creativity or does it need to be in a specific art and design environment to get the most out of it because obviously that's what's happened in the last hundred years I, I mean, if anyone wants to sort of address that. Well, uh, before before we you know before mm. we start on that, I think that right now uh, we're trying to teach mountaineering without having taught walking. Uh, <laughs> the, it's mm. impossible to do that. So first of all, we have to make sure that everyone is proficient in walking. And by walking, I mean in the visual art and design environment. Uh, I mean the students need need to be able to see. So the problem is, for example, when giving feedback right now is that a significant number of students are looking at the same piece of work, but they're not seeing the same piece of work. Hence, even if they receive the best feedback, the best advice, they cannot incorporate it. Right, so how do we address so, that? One second, one second. So, so first of all, yeah, we have to be able to teach, uh, ensure that everybody's on the same page in art and design. Yeah? So if you're going to an art and design mm -hmm. discipline, you have to understand what you're entering into. I'm just yeah. addressing the problems that are, we are facing right now with the current batch of students. Yeah, not not with not, not with the batch of when we all of us yeah. studied, because when we all of us studied, it was a completely different world. The current batch of students, uh, they must we must ensure that they're able to to see visually, and uh, I understand that uh, in, in China they're doing a fantastic job of that uh, because they are very proficient in drawing, so they are very proficient in seeing. Yeah, in the visual yeah. arts, at the same time. Uh, being a designer is quite an egotistical uh, profession sometimes. So we also have to ensure that there is values of a community, like 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 me like Min said, about ensuring mm -hmm. that there's values of a community that the design or a vision has a specific impact on society today, and that mm -hmm. impact of the design from 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 the great designer is very rarely uh, calculated. For example, now we have many companies that uh, uh, ensure that they are so green and so fantastic. Uh, yet uh, the right to repair and repairability of products coming out uh, is uh, less and less and less. Basically, companies right now are selling more and more products that, are, that, are, that cannot be repaired. So, and, but, but, and at the same time, they're claiming that they're green. Uh, so we have to ensure that uh, we also teach that once a design is out, once a, cre once a creation is out, that has an impact. Has, has but a, is a design a, school the best environment yeah. to teach that? Is, a, is, a, is an art school the best environment to teach that in the new world? Because we've had 100 years of an art school based on what's loosely a Bauhaus curriculum, and it all made sense, yeah, but, and it but, built, you know, there are other people doing that. Mm -hmm. but, but actually, reusability, mm -hmm. sustainability, uh, ethics, you know, all of these things, are art schools the well, best? Well, the place? Bauhaus curriculum... Uh, didn't need to think about that because at, 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 yeah. at, at the time everything was repairable. It was, it was, it was without thinking. They, 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 the products mm. came with the service <laughs> manuals, so that you bought the fridge mm. in the Bauhaus time and you had the service manual. It was 100% repairable and it lasted for 80 mm. years. Yeah, it didn't have embedded planned obsolescence. Right now, uh, products have planned obsolescence more and more and more and more. The latest products that, that came out this year uh, are not repairable on purpose. And no, I, I, around totally. the world is, is being shot down. So, totally, but, but but there's a wider sort of issue here of saying, okay, you know, we've got those problems and we know that's happening, but what is the best environment to start teaching? Because for me, this, you know, obviously the title of this session was rebooting the bath. So if you reboot, <coughs> what shape should it take going ahead? I mean, Kadeen, I'd be interested in hearing hearing your views on that from yeah, um, I, I, I echo the sentiments um, from Lev Terrace and also from, from Wang and, and Richard. I think this is, um, you know, ever more so important, particularly now, um, the fourth industrial revolution, um, which has brought advanced robotics, autonomous transport, artificial intelligence, machine learning, advanced materials, Richard, which we've spoken a bit about um, previously, biotechnology, um, and also the, the kind of future in terms of extended reality and all of these kind of digital 3D uh, workflows. And I think that the developments um, are going to continue to transform the way that we educate, the way that we live and the way that we work. And I think that some of the jobs um, that exist now will completely disappear. I think that we're preparing young people for a future um, and jobs that we don't even know will exist. <laughs> 
um, in my opinion. And I think that, you know, there will be um, new jobs that will come out of that. And I think what is certain is that the future workforce will need to align its skill set in order to keep pace. And I think that I'm interested in, you know, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, being able to work as a team, people <laughs> management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence. I think that's going to be really significant skill. Um, judgment and decision making, thinking about negotiation, thinking about cognitive flexibility. I think those are all key skills that we need to be instilling in, in our young people. The other point I wanted to make was around um, what's been going on, particularly during um, the global health pandemic here in the UK, as hundreds and thousands of children in the UK found themselves shut out of the education system during lockdown without access to laptops, without access to internet. Um, and I think we've got a, a huge challenge, um, particularly around the digital divide and digital skills gap that we have here in the UK. Um, I'm really interested in hearing um, from uh, Wang in particular, what we might be able to learn um, in terms of um, the uh, digital skills agenda uh, in China uh, and ways that we could be adopting um, some of that best practice here in the UK, because um, to my knowledge, um, access to digital technologies, access to laptops and access to the internet um, is, uh, is something that we have a big challenge um, with. And I think that um, the, the digital gap is, is dividing. And I think that in the UK, an online education um, you know, during lockdown and study materials, electronic school management system um, for early years have, um, have not been in place. And I think that we need to be really thinking about that and reassessing that uh, for future generations. I think... Um... Yeah, okay. I mean, Phil, I don't know if you've got anything you want to sort of respond to any of that about. No, I, I still bang on about, yeah. uh, I think all of these skills people will easily pick up and use. And the one skill we need to train is this thinking process, how you produce all-rounded skill sets um, where they're trained in creative problem solving, which you then use the same skill sets in anything that materialises. <laughs> No, I'd, I'd agree from my own work. Um, you know, I find myself still thinking like an artist when I'm dealing with a security breach, uh, which sounds ridiculous, but actually mm. the idea that you, you test things, you fail, you test, you fail, you know, you learn from each round of test and fail is very much a modern way of approaching work. And actually that's how I was taught to sort of explore concepts, you know, 35 years ago. Um Myself, I was lucky to be taught by conceptual artists, I guess, rather. And, and conceptual art didn't care about the technique as such. Generally, it, you know, it, it was concerned about the concept and you could do it in whatever form you wanted, if it was appropriate and it was completely justified and all of that stuff. Whereas I think I've met a lot of people who have been taught how to draw, how to paint, etc., within a certain set limit of, <laughs> of style, if you like, or approach. And that freedom to think is certainly what's helped me become a successful emerging technology architect, as well as a successful educator uh, in terms of art within creative technologies. And I think we're all saying the same thing. I mean, I'd be interested to hear more I mean, from you about, you know, what Left Eris said about, about the drawing programs, about, about you know, the, their approach to making sure everybody from cradle to grave has access to digital technologies <laughs> in China and things. Um, so currently in China, the, they want box it. Currently in China, artificial intelligence is uh, getting quickly into the design field, into design industry. Uh, starting 19, uh, 20, 16, uh, Alibaba, the company who um, uh, come up with uh, uh, an AI solution to design banners. Uh, at that year, uh, September, now November 11, 
just in one day, their AI system created 110 million banners. Each banner is different. It's individualized banner to send it to customers. So that's 110 each day. That system, which called the system called Luban, create at least 50 million banner a day, usually 50 to 60 million banner a day. And uh, last year, November 11, on that day, the system created over 4 million, uh, 400 million banners just in one day. So that gave a kind of a, a shock to designers because those banners used to be done by in-house designer or a designer hired outside. And that's a huge amount of work designer lost to that system. And uh, so you probably all know there are so many um, either software or a kind of uh, AI solution to help people design logos and to come up with a VI system and to come up with a layout, to come up with posters. And uh, a lot of designers start using it. And, uh, and also companies start using it. Most of those solutions are free, which means the traditional kind of work for designers are going to disappear. So uh, I keep telling people, this is a, a good thing. A good thing, which means uh, the computer taking away the work, which is more labor intensive, more um, the, the, the computer, the AI, the machine could make our work more productive. And then we can focus on creativity, focus on problem solving, focus on concept, ideas, which does is still huge advantage. So I don't see this is a really a thing which is taking away all designers' work, but uh, I rather uh, see this uh, um, a good thing to help designer. But back to how do we work with AI? How our student will work with AI in the future? I think for certain designers, they do need to learn how to Program. They do need to learn how AI works in order to train the machine, in order to find uh, the usage uh, concept, usage project, or usage uh, place. So that still need a human to come up with solution. So. Uh, but the work for the traditional design work, production work, is all getting less and less. To deal with this, I think a designer should be more back to creators, more back to uh, the old days being uh, artistic. So that in the AI age, I think art, is going to become more important. It's going to be more, uh, with more value. And uh, which means uh, uh, design school, art school, we still have a job to do to train designer with uh, creativity. So with that thinking in mind, I think um, art school or design school we still need to teach people how to draw. Uh, 
we still need to teach people how to look things and how to create things and uh, how to think um, not like a machine, but like an artist. Um, there's one person, uh, a scientist, and uh, he said, um, he said in the machine age, in the AI age, there will be only two, per two kind of person left. One is uh, people who don't need to work and it's just uh, relaxing. And, uh, and then another kind of person will be the creative person. And uh, the investors who invest into technology and then the, the people like artists. I think uh, in, the, in, in, the, in those machine age, in the AI age, uh, all designer will have uh, much more things to do uh, than in the past. Um, it makes me think of um, the, the days when, uh, when I was working at Adobe in 19, uh, later 1980s and uh, beginning of the 90s. And the people are thinking, wow, uh, Adobe, uh, Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop, and PageMaker, and uh, InDesign. Well, taking away all designers' work, and then designer going to uh, lose their job. But the reality was, and then in the later 90s, not designer didn't lose their job, but the society, the industry need more designer because first there's a CD ROM and we have a new way of uh, uh, communicate, uh, doing com communication. We have new ways of uh, uh, sending uh, and we need a designer to do the, the CD ROM. And then quickly there's the internet starting 1995 and then we need designer to do a, a website. And uh, so the designer being needed much more than before. I remember when I first started working uh, in my studio in San Francisco uh, with my um, schoolmate, Eddie Lee, and uh, we couldn't find a designer in San Francisco. Uh, we had a Toulouse designer from Texas and a hire an art director from Chicago. So that uh, kind of gives me a lesson that uh, technology will replace certain kind of uh, uh, work, certain kind of job, take away those jobs. But at the same time, technology will create new but jobs. I think Kadeem you know, suggested that. We don't even know what half of the job will be that, that people will take because we don't know at the edges what the new yeah. technology and interaction with humans will actually create gaps for. But we do know, and what we've all said, is that we're thinking that we still need people to be creative, to be critical, to be philosophical, ethical, all yes. of that. And Phil, you were nodding, you were nodding through a lot of men's um, thought mm. then. I don't know if you want to sort of... Well, uh, because I was... Ag I, I'm oh, agreeing, agreeing with the whole concept of the... Um, You've got to train people to be problem solvers and creatives to, to relax and have ideas. And then, uh, it's very noisy. Very noisy. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you could put your hand over your microphone for a moment. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. And I think. Okay, let's. If you, if you I will have, mute it. It, uh, for a time. Okay. I think if you've trained people to to, to think and to de to relax and actually go back to playing and being creative, and they've got the skills to actually see things and develop things, and all their creativity doesn't come from staring into a computer, um, then then you will be able to have people trained to use new technology. I mean, the Mac got rid of five assistants. It put more it put more control in the hands of designers. AI is doing the same thing. 
if you can produce five million layouts on a business card, but at the end of it, someone chooses which is the aesthetically the best answer to what that problem is. So I think as long as we're training people to expand their minds, we will have people who can adapt to whatever the new technology is. And I think what happens is designers get fascinated on how, if they can just come up with concepts, then the new technology just gives them more and more ways of expressing but you do have to have the ability to have the equipment to do it, which is a problem socially dividing part of England. And that is a big problem. I mean, it's, so how do schools start to address this problem? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking that's where people get used to, you know, an interactive technology would start their learning and learn how to learn. Ignoring the art schools actually below that, you know, sort of five to eight years old. How do schools start to approach that? Kadeem, do you want to? I think that's um, a really good question. And um, I'm interested in ways that we can kind of connect um, the creativity, if you like, in terms of um, skinning our young people and equipping them. And I think creativity, um, as Phil and Wang um, have both alluded to, is going to be you know, one of the key skills and attributes um, in order to, to navigate the world in the future. And I think preparing our young people for that um, from a very young age, um, nursery age, you know, in, in primary school, um, and looking at some of the, the good kind of work that's being done um, around kind of design and engineering and 3D and digital and thinking about how we can kind of harness opportunities um, for students to connect with AI, um, with robotics, with coding, um, and also thinking about how we can support teachers as well. So I've been doing um, lots of work, particularly around science, art, design, digital design um, and emerging technologies, um, working closely with schools, working closely with teachers and young people and indeed their parents <laughs> um, and thinking about um, these kind of digital skills uh, in particular, um, using virtual reality or game engines to um, create opportunities to explore and tell new stories and to play um, and to interact with one another and I think that it's really important that we look at ways that we can support not just students but also teachers uh, and their parents and I think that opportunities for knowledge transfer and exchange building academic and industry partnerships um, and looking at ways that we can kind of support every student, um, particularly now uh, in a post-pandemic world, um, and thinking about educational programs that look to en enhance learning, um, but putting technology and creativity at the very heart is something that I'm, I'm very much focused on. Do you think, um, I mean, one of the things we've heard from Min and myself in the past with courses have had terrific trouble finding educators of the same mindset. Um, very intelligent, educated people, creative people, etc., but not with that mindset. Um, often, and how do you think we address that problem then? Because what you're talking about there is helping teachers and parents to develop. Um, where, how do we address that skills issue in terms of educating? I think uh, Richard. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I think okay. we, we need oh. to, to look at ways that we can work with industry. I think we need to learn from other countries around the world um, that have uh, industry partnerships, mentoring programs, apprenticeship pathways into design and looking at how we can harness 
um, opportunities around BIM technology, around the machine learning, three D printing, rapid prototypes, product design, actually cutting edge software uh, and hardware um, as tools to release new ideas um, and to give birth to new ideas and, and new ways of thinking. And I think collaborating, um, particularly sharing best practice. Um, and supporting teachers and parents as well um, is something that we need to be doing much more of and that there needs to be more funding. And I, I, I did speak to that, to that point earlier on, um, but I'm, I'm very much thinking a lot about um, up and down the country here in the UK. Um, and I think that there are cultural benefits, there are schools that are being funded, and I think we need to really look at better policies and better implementation and better infrastructure for the education system uh, to address this I'm thinking about, I'm also thinking about the kind of apprenticeships and, and pathways for um, learning. Uh, I mean, it's very noisy. And also thinking about okay. the, the uh, education. But anyway, Mina, you wanted to say something, so if, please go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, what I was uh, going to see, yeah, I'm going to change location. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> you've got you've got the government lately stopped yeah. the arts in junior schools and in secondary schools. They played they went against the arts, which won't help future generations come back to. Well, I mean, uh, my feeling on that, Phil, is they told us to retrain, didn't they, if we were out of work, um, come out of the arts and retrain, but they never said what as or what in, which I find appalling. <laughs> it's just leave it behind. And you're right, they totally ignored the arts in schools. And also, we've, we've been talking about technology as if it is this uh, neutral thing. Yeah, Technology is imbued by the values of its designers. And, and, and we have a responsibility to, to start a conversation about values like we're talking about now, values behind the technology. Because if you, if you program technology with certain values, it's just going to propagate those values. And we are already seeing the effects of that. We're already seeing the effects of a technology that is lacking in values, or it, it's actually not lacking, but it's actually being used with, with um, misplaced values. Uh, so if anything, designers will have this, again, what, what, what Min was saying before, about making sure that the values of designers are in the right place. Welcome back, Min. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, I found a quiet place. That is Sorry quiet. For the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was uh, in a coffee shop and it's uh, so noisy. Now it's better. And I, I found a, a quiet corner. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um. So what we were talking about, I think, is that, that, that I think I think that you know my question, in a sense, was where do we or how do we get people who can teach in this way? Because we seem to be lacking that. There are people like ourselves who actually do think across borders and across boundaries and think differently, but there's an awful lot of teachers, as in any profession, who just do their job as they are seeing. They do it well but they don't push boundaries. People, Some people just don't, some do. Where do we find the people with the skills to be able to change how we educate in art and design? Yeah, this is really a challenge. It's something that I've been facing for the last 17 years since I returned to China. So uh, to train faculty members, to find good faculty members that are always uh, uh, on top of my, of my agenda. But sometimes you just don't have that kind of people uh, handy you can find. So to train the faculty member become very important. So uh, to have a panel, to have a conference, 
to have a, a discussion like this definitely will help help people to think and help people to look into the future and to let them be aware that the old way, the old, old way of working, the way of uh, teaching is going to be dated. It's not going to work. So by doing this, and uh, some people will change. And uh, so I do see a lot of people I know through the years, they have changed their mind. They have adopted the new technology, not only the technology, but the new way of thinking. So I think that this is uh, something if we keep talking and the people will hear it and people will change. So uh, in China now, especially this is a, a big problem. Uh, when I returned in China in 2003, and uh, just China start expanding design education within a very, very short period of time, time. and there's so many design programs been added. Now we have over 2,000 universities offering design education. The total number of students study design in school, I mean, not the school, but the university. Mm. Now it's over 2 million students. Each year, school, uh, each year there are over half a million students entering university to study design. About three years ago, we start talking about, we have too many design students. Maybe we should reduce the size of design education. And then there was an alarming kind of um, sign that uh, it's getting harder to find a design job several years ago. But the thing is, the last two years, not only we didn't reduce the size of an uh, incoming student, we increased a lot. Year before last year, no, last year was over 600,000, 650,000 new students entering universities to study design. This year is 2020, we had over 700,000 new students entering university. That make teacher issue more urgent. A good teacher, a teacher which have a good understanding of uh, what the future designer should be, what kind of person we should educate. And uh, because if we don't have a good teacher, if they teach student the way which uh, really dated, we make so many students walk into society. Not only they couldn't find a job, but even they find a job and the job going, is going to disappear very soon. So, uh, so this is really a big uh, agenda. And uh, so we talk about this issue a lot. To me, back to uh, the discussion we had uh, at the beginning, I think the important thing is uh, how to educate a person who is critical thinking ability, who is creative thinking ability. A person knows how to solve problem, able to solve problem, able to work with others, able to look into other industry, look into other discipline, able to work with uh, different people and uh, to solve problem. So if we have this in mind to train the people how to think, how to solve problem, then 
when they walk out of school, if uh, there are not in, enough design jobs, they can do other things and they do well. So if and, we, well, I was just going to ask, if we train people to think, which I think all three of us certainly, uh, all four of us agree with, but does that then imply that we have to change the way we teach art and design lower down? Because at the moment, we'll sit people in art rooms and they learn to draw and this, that, and the other, and, and they learn to paint and they do pottery and they do all of this. But a lot of that is craft, not necessarily critical thinking. Do we have to change that? I think, I think we still... Sorry. Uh, sorry, 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 Phil. I was going to say... I think you for... Yeah, yeah. You go. Sorry. Uh, Phil, Phil, yeah. Just sorry. Quick, I was just thinking you have to start <laughs> training before art school. You have to yes. start training at junior school and you have to you have to start training a lot lower. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Interrupted. Sorry, man. Yeah. I think the, uh, for certain things, the art school training we have had for so many years, some may still continue because we still need the people to make pottery, to make jewelry. Also at the same time, we will have a machine, have a AI to have to design, to produce jewelry, to produce pottery. But I think that the pottery made by a person still will have a big value. Mm -hmm. So we still need to have those uh, school. So I think when we talk about design education, we should not generalize design education because design, there are so many different design and we should have different ways of teaching design in different school. We should have different school. For instance, the school I used to teach or used to manage, the Central Academy. The Central Academy of Fine Art is a fine art based school. And for many, many years, there were no design education. We, uh, the school is all painters, sculptors, and uh, all fine art. And uh, when we start doing design education in uh, Kafa, and uh, for me, uh, returning from the U.S. and uh, with a uh, uh, kind of a technology background uh, accumulated from Silicon Valley and, uh, and also with uh, uh, some design thinking, design education thinking in mind. And uh, I wanted to do something different, something more uh, suitable for the future. And, uh, but once I got into that system, that school, uh, the Central Academy. And uh, I realized we seen a fine art university. I should utilize the advantage of fine art kind of environment. And uh, using that environment to train designers more uh, with creative thinking, but also with uh, artistic Thinking mm. and with uh, a creativity that uh, could change the landscape of uh, Chinese uh, visual culture to produce new things visually, to have a good aesthetic kind of uh, uh, judgment for our student. So, uh, and then by doing this, instead of uh, training them with uh, uh, working with in the other area, and uh, quickly, we um, think, um, we have. Well, no, I, I mean, I think the visual communication department. Yeah. Sorry, no. I'm just going to say that the master's sorry, degree sorry. I did yeah. 25 years ago was taught by artists who taught computing and physics and yeah. maths for artists to use, and we had exactly that. We had art thinking as such, rather than design thinking. Yeah. Can we just have yeah. thinking? Yeah, well, this... <laughs> yeah. 
Go on. I mean, feel free to elucidate on that, Phil, because actually... Well, no, yeah. I just, yeah. just mean creative thinking is creative thinking. Why give it a label it's all fine art or not fine art? Yeah. Why don't you, it's just training someone. Yeah. But I think the issue in terms of schools yeah, then right. is the purity of how you teach things because you've got, you know, it's getting back to pure subjects is what you're saying effectively. We need to teach people how to think and there are no boundaries to thinking. Correct. Well, in, in a so, way, the body, the body of design is art. It's yeah. only very recently that we've cut off art design from art. So yeah. a design can only be understood within an art context. It's like yeah. teaching medicine and only teaching from your elbow to your hand. It's impossible. You have to, you have to teach the whole body. So, um, Could they, uh, oh, Kafa, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Of design. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> at that time, we emphasize on uh, a design education model uh, within our school. I think uh, it was really working in a very short of period of time. And uh, uh, our student, our faculty, become well-rounded in graphic design, for instance, in photography, in jewelry, and uh, uh, in our graphic design department, we uh, have six IG member, AGI member, and uh, which is uh, is a, a really um, hard to find any other school uh, with uh, six IG member in graphic design within one faculty. And uh, so, but this is a, a, a time which uh, I think is, uh, um, I found this is really working well within the art, fine art school. But now uh, being at the Tongji University, a comprehensive or more a technology based university. And uh, we could do things differently we could uh, easily add the computation of kind of teaching into uh, the curriculum. And that the students are good with uh, programming, good with coding. And then they are good with working with uh, uh, AI. And uh, then, uh, although we teach uh, like we finding uh, project or, or class, but we finding class turn in to combine with uh, a new technology. Like just yesterday, yesterday I uh, was involved with a class and uh, a class with uh, three subjects. One subject is uh, we finding for a new uh, high-speed train station in Hangzhou, which is uh, in the planning stage, uh, should be ready in two years. And uh, the new navigation system students are working on is heavily related on uh, technology. They needed to work with the indoor navigation system, which is still being developed, and, uh, and then come up with different kind of navigation, uh, mostly in their, in their phone, or not phone, but uh, different terminals. So, um, and also, uh, like um, uh, we, uh, the 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 second subject was uh, uh, post-pandemic uh, working space solution. So that one is the same. Is uh, needed to think of more uh, with a new kind of technology. And uh, so my thinking is, we need a different kind of school. We need a different kind of a design education model and for serve for different purpose. And uh, we cannot have a cookie cutter design education model, uh, one model fits all. So uh, the traditional art school will still have a value in the future during the AI time when machine took over so many opportunities, so many jobs, artists will still have a job, will still have an opportunity to create. Um, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, Kadeen, yeah. uh, do you want to respond to that? Or, or 
disagree yeah, or agree? I agree. Or? I think that obviously due to automation, we're going to see many um, jobs um, uh, being wiped out completely due to the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think when we look at the potential for driverless vehicles and the most popular job in the United States of America, for example, is a truck driver. So what will happen to all of those truck drivers <laughs> um, if we go to uh, driverless vehicles and um, those, uh, those jobs are completely are completely gone. And I think we, we kind of need to think about um, having a creative vision for our lives um, and for society and how it's organized and how we, we kind of navigate the world of the future um, and the role and the meaning of work. Um, and I think um, policymakers, teachers, business leaders, and individual workers will all have um, a constructive and, and an important role, hopefully, to play uh, in order to transition um, to the roles and jobs of the future. Um, and creativity and that mindset and adaptability is, is going to be paramount to, to that, to be able to, to navigate the world. And I think history shows us that societies across the globe when faced with monumental challenges, such as the one that we're facing at the moment, due to the global health emergency, can often rise to those occasions for the well-being of their citizens. And we must make sure um, that we're able to um, address um, the digital gap and the digital divide, and also make sure that work is meaningful um, and that there are jobs um, for the next generation that are well paid um, and that are fun and that they are um, able to, to do. And I think that creativity is gonna be central to that. The other point I wanted to make was making sure that we value art and we value our artists uh, and we value um, the status and the importance for an arts education and that we prioritise dedicated art spaces and that we open up collections and technology can be used as a tool to do that. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about how we can direct, develop a range of, of partnerships to facilitate curricula and extra, extra curricula um, offerings and thinking about maintaining um, and prioritizing opportunities for teachers and for and for parents and thinking at putting you know an arts um, and design education at the center in terms of science engineering mathematics technology artificial intelligence and encompassing this kind of commitment to lifelong learning and being able to instill that i think are the things that are most important and what i'm thinking a lot about at the moment I think, I think what's interesting is that, that what interests me a lot is the fact that going back slightly as well, you're absolutely, we do need to consider all of that. And I think we also, that, that notion of breaking the cookie cutter, because one of the, the underlying principles behind the title of the session, Breaking the Bear House, is I think the Bear House gave us a model that was so appropriate for the age it was developed in, mm -hmm. is that almost everybody used that same model. And yet we are now clearly in a, in a divergent age where things are mm. starting to move away from each other. And I'll be interested, you know, particularly, you know, uh, to hear about how you think, you know, breaking that cookie, more on that, breaking the cookie cutter. I mean, Phil, it's, you, you've talked about well, thinking, also, why, shouldn't, why shouldn't designers come out of a philosophy school? Well, they could, but, but also you have this slight problem that art schools are in universities and it's mm. not an academic. I don't think it's an academic, art is not an academic subject. And I also think that while we have funding, how do you fund the working classes to go to art school now? How do you fund these? Yeah. The art schools are run to make money. They're, they're putting kids in one end of a sausage factory and turning them out. And their degree of success is they've got enough money. If it's all run by, run in a financial way, it's not run by governments to help build the, the, the next generation of creatives. 
But what you're saying, I mean, what we're all saying is that there's going to be terrific value economically in the next generations of art and design students, because as I think we've all said, there are new jobs going to emerge that we don't even know about. Yeah. You know, and things are going to appear that uh, that, that 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 are going to need these critical skills. So, do you think it's? I'm, I'm presume then you're saying that actually the wise investment would be not to cut art and design education, but to actually expand it. Yes, I would expand it, and I'd also find a way of making sure that every level of society can come into it, mm -hmm. because English art schools are now becoming middle class places. Mm. Sorry, we have some questions from the chat. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, what are your thoughts about incorporating XR technologies in, into design education? Okay, Kadeen, seeing as your, your company's called XR, what, I've forgotten well, the name. I think one of the things that was really apparent uh, in terms of incorporating XR into the future of learning um, was looking at the kind of work that we've been doing with setting up a, a digital skills academy. Um, so working using virtual reality to build uh, immersive worlds and environments um, and using that as a, uh, as a space for, for learning um, and training. So giving young people opportunities to get hands on with these technologies and to start to think about how they can be used in the classroom um, alongside augmented reality um, and also thinking about Unreal and Unity and creating opportunities for students to start to play around and explore with those technologies and also some of the um, tools like Blender um, and other kind of digital software um, so some of the other things that are also quite interesting to me are thinking about how we're also training future workforces. For example, we've been working uh, on a major infrastructure project where we took um, engineering data into virtual reality and created um, uh, a series of scenarios which were then being used to train the workforce um, across um, one of the biggest infrastructure projects in the country, actually, across the River Thames. So I think there's a number of ways that we can be using extended reality, VR, augmented reality as a, as a tool to educate um, young people and also how it can be used as a tool to educate future workforces. Can I ask a question directly to that? If you have a 16-year-old and they're doing exams or their high school certificates or whatever, at that sort of age, and they want to submit a piece of work for their examination that is built on the Unity engine, how does the art and design teacher know what is good and what is bad in order to pass that exam? Well, and I think this is a really great to the mind of people. There's <laughs> lots that needs to be done in terms of making these um, technologies accessible to teachers and also um, to students. And I think that there's a cost barrier to that um, and also having access to a laptop or having access to the internet. These are all things that a student is going to need in order to be able to start to play around with Unreal Engine or with Unity. And often, you know, these platforms and, and game engines are free to use, but you will need to have a facility and an infrastructure in place in order to access those tools. But it strikes me that I could, I could make a judgment call based on my own experience, but only after 30 years of working across different sectors. So the fact that I worked on, you know, in Xbox at the time of Xbox One launch, I've built quite a lot of games, casual games, etc. I could look at a Unity engine output as an examination piece and make some kind of considered judgment, whether it was good or bad as a piece of art, if you like, or as a piece of design. How does a standard art and design teacher do that if they've had where do they get the education from themselves? 
I mean, that, that to me is really pertinent. I guess teachers really also need to be thinking point. about upskilling yeah. and, and moving with the technologies and tools um, of the time. And I think, you know, there are a number of free applications and opportunities out there. Unreal Engine, for example, um, have opened up, you know, advanced real-time 3D creation tools um, that are continue, continuing to evolve across so many different industries. Um, so thinking about ways that teachers and students can engage with that um, and also thinking about the kind of future of work and how those technologies are going to be embedded uh, into um, manufacturing sector, into the fashion industry, into the VFX sector, um, the film industries. I think that there's going to be a number of roles um, and opportunities that will come from having a knowledge and understanding of how to use these tools and applications. I think I think that that I mean, if I can interrupt one more time, it's and I will shut up in a moment. I okay. promise. Um, <laughs> but I'm just thinking if you give people the right, you know, the ability to do this stuff, how do we know what's good or bad? I'll tell you where that question comes from. It comes from seeing over 30 years a lot of people making what we call digital art or computer art. And almost none of it moves me emotionally. I look at it, I think that's quite pretty or that's quite clever. It's using data, it's using this, it's using that, and it's pulling this information out, it's presenting information. But I don't cry in the way I might cry if I watch a cinema film or a theatre play. I don't feel happy particularly when I've seen it. And it's almost like they're learning how to use the technology, but they're not learning how to express themselves through it. Mm. And I think that's a, there's a similar case here for designers because obviously the best designers, you can see their work and you know it straight away. There's clearly something of them in that work mm. and they're, they're making the tools do that. So I wonder how, if we could sort of address that, how we make that sort of expressiveness and personality come through because we've talked here about jobs because quite rightly that's the major issue I think most people think about, how we survive in the economy. But there is this personality and expressiveness and aesthetic quality to things that we need to learn to sort of judge because I, I couldn't put a price yeah. on computer art at the moment no it, but it, it it's this whole thing of does does a piece of art carry the dna of a person and the energy which is coming from that body into it which is human compared with the blandness we're all seeing from what's being produced by people <laughs> computers <laughs> Well, I, I disagree with that. I think that artists throughout the history of time have adapted their, their tools um, to meet with what surrounds them. And I think that, you know, we're building the machines, we're building the AI, we're building the technology. There's always going to be a human element um, in terms of that. But going back to the point around the kind of future skills piece, I think that there's going to be a huge demand for real-time 3D skills. Um, we're seeing that at the moment. It's at an all-time high level in terms of learning um, about how to use Unreal Engine, Unity, um, and these sorts of um, game engines um, to enhance and open up career opportunities. And I think that um, there's going to be lots of great art that's that's produced in the future. How are they going to produce art if they concentrate on the technique? Sorry? How are they going to produce great... This is being <clears throat> provocative. How are they going to produce great art if they only concentrate on the technique? I think that it's going to be a combination of <clears throat> um, building your technique and what is great art? Who says what's great art? You, me? I think it's <laughs> um, a whole other debate that we could get stuck into. <laughs> Yeah, um, we are we are actually approaching you know, about mind the, and, and wanting to explore and play around with all of these tools and technologies is something that um, I think could be very exciting for young people, um, particularly in terms of jobs of the future. We are approaching for about an hour and a half of, of the oh, right, okay. of the uh, of the panel. Yeah, so it might be good to uh, have some conclusions and uh, wrap it up gradually and, and gently. I, th I think, yeah, okay. I mean, well, one of the key things we've talked about is the need to sort of understand critical thinking and to put thinking at the heart of what we're doing moving ahead. Um, I think there's another point there that um, we can't, we have to work harder to find the teachers who can do this of the right mindset, if you like, 
So there's a, a sort of bigger reset shell around that. Um, but also, I think the last point was really interesting that if you give the skills to play with these things, that from it will emerge the art, if you like. Um, and, and I mean, it's quite nice to have a sort of summary of your thinking from each of you. I mean, on, on those sort of points that we've discussed. Phil, if we want to start with you. Um, I just think it's going to take, create, I just think we need to train creative problem solving people. And then the technology, they'll know how to use the technology. Kadeen. I want to end on a on a high note. Um, I think you can achieve the unachievable. I think that you need to aim beyond what you're capable of. I think you need to have an open mind and want to know about as much as possible. Feed your mind across all different subjects, art, technology, science, all of those um, uh, kind of skills and attributes of the future will be about being able to adapt and being able to have an open mind. And I think we must develop um, a space for young people, particularly to um, be able to open up their minds and to try to do new things and to think about all of the things that, um, you know, technology is going to allow us to do in, in order to shape a better society, a more just world, um, and also how technology might be able to help us to, leave a lighter footprint on the, the planet and the climate and ecological emergency. Um, and I think that there's lots to play for. And finally, Min. Yeah. Um, I think this is a really huge responsibility for all design educators. We do need to prepare our students for the future. We do need to prepare our students able to work with machine and able to, to be more creative than the machine and more with more humanity than the machine. So we do need to teach our students and uh, to work in the future, to work along with the machine we have to be more hu human. We have to really work for the common good of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, using one word I th I'm thinking is uh, we really should prepare our student design for the oneness of humanity, regardless how much machine will be there, regardless mm -hmm. how much the world is going to evolve, how to evolve. And the designer is in a good position to change the world, to design the world, to design a better future. So with that in mind, that make me kind of my heart getting heavier and heavier. And, uh, we, uh, we do have a, a big job ahead of us to work with our students. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you thank all. You. Uh, Larry, so over to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I would second, I would second, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, actually, it's, we have to really look at the values of, what, of, of behind what we're doing. Because right now, we seem to be creating more inequality mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, less equal participation, less, less access. So we really have to start looking behind the values uh, behind of our actions. And then, uh, then again, what, what I said earlier about teaching walking before climbing as well. Yeah. Thank you all yeah. for, for taking part. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think it's fantastic. And also, yeah. I, I won't speak for the panelists, but I'm certainly happy to be co you know, contacted if anyone wants to talk further. How can um, our, sure, our yeah. audience contact you? How can people contact you? Well, you can normally find me on Twitter under at Dickie Adams. I'm either talking about art, music, and design or moaning about the government. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Twitter's the easiest way or Fantastic. richardfadams.com. Richardfadams.com. Um, I'm organizing quite a few design events in China. Phil came last year to the 
Asia Design uh, Management Forum, which uh, uh, I have been the chair of the forum for last eight years. And uh, I also uh, uh, one of the founder of Beijing Design Week, and then there's a Zhuhai Design Week. So I'm hoping to um, have you all come over to give a talk in person, not a virtual, and uh, maybe next year or year <laughs> yeah. after next year. So hope to see you in China. That. Yeah. That would be amazing. I would be honored. And, um, I loved yeah. hearing the insights today um, to be sharing the uh, virtual stage with you all. Thank you, Left Terrace, for bringing us together. Thank you, Richard, for guiding us so expertly um, during this um, really inspiring conversation. And um, it's really um, great to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.